Hi, Dr. Schmidt. Thank you so much for coming on the Thrival Nutrition Podcast. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you for having me. Yes. I am so excited to be talking with you about insulin resistance. Um, but first, before we get started, introduce yourself, who you are, and what you do. All right. So my name is uh, Darren Schmidt. I'm a chiropractor in Michigan, and I've had a what I call hardcore holistic nutrition practice since 1998. <laughs> and that's what I do. I have a, my practice has uh, five other practitioners. And we're, I think we're in the top 1% for private nutrition clinics as far as size and number of people that we see. And private meaning we don't carry any insurance because insurance won't take us. So it's all like a cash practice. So we're, we're really busy. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that is just where it's going. Insurance doesn't really, when I try to explain to people like why insurance isn't always the best, I mean, it's great, but you totally get what you pay for. Um, right. So I get, understand that. So talking about insulin resistance, um, we'll just start off with the basic question of what is it? Well, <clears throat> so insulin resistance is really two things. It's number one, high insulin. And then number two, uh, the insulin can't get into the cells and make the cells do what they're supposed to do, which is utilize uh, glucose just to keep it real simple. So, and it, it's caused by um, eating excessive amounts of carbohydrates for a long period of time. And there's a guy named Dr. Kraft with a K. I don't know if you've heard of him. I haven't. No. Okay. So he's like probably the top researcher and he just died a couple of years ago. He was in his nineties but he did most of his research in the 60s and 70s. He did autopsies and he did uh, blood chemistries. And he determined over the years that um, if anybody over the age of, I think 21 or 19, the percentage of people with insulin, high insulin is uh, 90%. Wow. And, right, so you're probably diabetic. I mean, I could just generally say that statement to anybody is you're probably diabetic unless you've actively worked on reversing that, considering our, our current food supply. Yeah, yeah. I find that the blood sugar and insulin relationship is probably the first one to go. Um, and then all the hor other hormones start to follow and stuff, because I feel like, again, it's our society. We're, we just eat. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, one way to really mess up like sex hormones or adrenal hormones and create stress and high adrenaline and cortisol the best way to do that is ha have a high insulin diet, a high sugar diet. Yeah. Um, and then with high insulin, is it always, will you always see high blood sugars? Are they always correlated together? Well, usually it's, it's the blood sugar uh, that is a late manifestation. So the insulin is high first and it could be for decades. And then later the blood sugar goes high. So people are diagnosed um, diabetes like 20 years too late or 40 yep. years too late. Yeah, it's very unfortunate. And I think too, um, something that I'm sure you'll you'll know and appreciate is the ranges are so, that's the issue I have with a lot of labs is the ranges are so broad. So there, if you're like one point under it or right, like going into the diabetic, they're like, you're fine. We don't need to see you until you're full blown diabetic, which bothers me. So I would love to hear too of what people should be aiming for with their labs. What are the optimal ranges? Good question. Yeah, so when it comes to insulin, um, a fasting insulin level should be below five easily. And there's another way to test it too, is postprandial. So you go to the lab, they draw your blood for insulin and sugar, and then they give you 75 grams of sugar to drink. And then they test it at 30 minutes, 60 minutes, two hours, three hours. And they, you can see the pattern. So the insulin goes up and down. And if it, it can go too high, it can go too high for too long. And there's, and Dr. Kraft found four patterns and um, people fall into those categories. So, and then you can compare that with the blood glucose. So yeah, the blood glucose can be like showing normal, but the insulin can be way off. Yeah. And so, yeah, so that's the total showing insulin resistance. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Um, and then what, so I know that you mentioned like too high carbs, just consistently over time, a lot of processed foods. What foods are ideal if someone's struggling with insulin resistance? Well, let me just state one thing first is that the really bad mixture is having high fat and high carbs at the same time. Okay, that's the standard American diet. And that leads to the three major chronic diseases, diabetes, heart disease, and um, cancer. So the to 
the best way to rever reverse the insulin resistance to lower diabetes, to solve type 2 diabetes, and to control type 1 diabetes is of the low-carb diet. And uh, one of the top research groups is called Verta Health, V-I-R-T-A. And um, so the foods are low carb and meat is low carb. Now, I, I promote meat eating and there's no real science that shows that meat causes any disease. Right. There's no science that shows it causes cancer or heart disease. But if you have meat, you know, high quantity of fat from whatever, it could be animal, it could be plant, plus the sugar, the sugar makes the fat, I call it a cluster bomb. So it goes throughout your body and it causes all kinds of damage in a wide variety of ways and it destroys your cell function, mitochondrial function, therefore tissues, you know, therefore, you know, organs. So the best way to reverse this problem with insulin um, is a low carb diet for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I think the the trending diet that's coming on now, which I'm a total meat eater too. Um, I don't actually work with a lot of vegans if they're not open to trying it because right. there's a lot of times that I see that I'm like, wow, meat could really make a difference. And if you're right. just not willing to, I can only help you so much, but um, it's the can kind I, of- can I, come on, can I comment on the vegan thing right now? So with my YouTube channel, I've been active for five years and it was 2017 when the vegans found me and they started <laughs> posting and posting and posting. And I didn't really, at the, at the beginning, I, I didn't block any because I was really trying to figure out why are they saying these things that they say? And then later, once they became belligerent, I would block them. But there is some value to initially start with some vegetables, right? Just like pure vegetables. I, give it, I can give an example of this too. But in the long, so it's a cleansing diet, but it doesn't build. So if you have like a heart issue, you want to rebuild your heart. So low carb diet is also cleansing, but it's also building too at the same time. So let me just give you a real quick example. I have a friend, her dog, her, the dog's name is Moose. Obviously, a dog's a carnivore, right? Should be eating meat. And at the age of nine years old, he had arthritis and he was kind of tired and set, laid down a lot. So my friend took this dog to a holistic vet and the vet said, give the dog a vegan diet. And then when the energy comes up and the joint pain's gone, feed the dog turkey meat from the store, raw, you know, and it's cheap. Turkey okay. meat is, you know. So two days of a vegan diet, this dog was up and running around and happy. So then she started feeding it meat, the foundational diet, right? So the point here is like the vegan diet is a cleansing diet and it works for a short period of time. And with the uh, clinical studies on insulin resistance, diabetes on veganism, whole food, plant-based, you get this dramatic drop in A1C, you know, which is the amount of damage that sugar does to your arteries. In the first three months and up to six months, you get this great drop, but then it starts climbing back up again. So over the course of a year and a half, there's basically only a 0.2% drop of A1C, whereas at the six month mark, it was like 1.2 or 1.3, I think. So that's why veganism is a little tricky because at first people feel lighter, they feel better. They may Which feel I think stronger. also because they're eating less crap, to be honest. Right, and they stopped eating the garbage, right, exactly. Thank you. So yeah, I would, because you said low carb, you know, especially in like the conventional nutrition, it's taught like legumes and like whole grains and stuff are super helpful for, you know, the fiber and like with diabetics. So I would love your input on it. <laughs> right. You hear that they're great because of the fiber, but then at right. the same time. Still right. And the, but so fiber is not an essential nutrient. Nobody needs fiber. And there's a clinical trial where people with IBS, they, the more fiber they had, the worse their symptoms. And then the group that had no fiber all their symptoms went away. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a non-essential nutrient for human beings. Yeah. And then, I mean, there's all kinds of arguments for and against, but one of the bigger arguments I hear is the fiber is needed for the microbiome in the gut to break down into short chain fatty acids. And then the microbiome eats that as their fuel. Yeah. But if you eat just, let's say you eat the carnivore diet, nothing but meat, there's short chain fatty acids in the meat, you know, and then there's um, collagen in the meat, and that's another source of food for the microbiome. So when you switch over away from uh, like more of a plant-based diet to more meat-based, your microbiome does change. And yeah. it's, it's neither good nor bad. It's just that's the way it is. Your microbiome changes, can change dramatically in a 24-hour period. So Yeah. Are, do you do carnivore? I'm, yeah, it's been a year. And um, it's trending. I feel like it's trending right now. Oh, it's been it's been so fantastic, and so easily my calories are easily ninety percent meat, and like I mean I'll go 
three days with nothing but meat, but I, you know, I still have some plants here, there. And I, on my YouTube channel, I say, I like to eat iceberg lettuce, but don't tell anybody, you know, cause people think iceberg lettuce is just water and fiber. But I, I looked in my refrigerator yesterday and I have this half iceberg lettuce. It's all brown. It's been sitting there for easily over a week. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'm not into iceberg lettuce anymore. <laughs> but yeah, but the carnivore, my carnivore experience has been fantastic. And it's not for everybody, you know, mm -hmm. that's a true statement, but you know, N equals one, everybody should figure out what they need. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely bio-individual, but I feel like it's trending. I'm seeing it a lot right now. Yeah. Um, which I think in just general, even if no one is ready to eat full carnivore, I don't think I'd ever go there um, all the way, but it just shows how much meat is healing and how powerful it is. And I right. think we've, it's, we've just demonized it so much for so right. many years right. that it's really refreshing to finally see like, no, it's not going to kill you. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's a guy that I knew when I lived in Toledo and he's currently on Instagram, his name is Don Mattis. And he posts, do you know, do you know Don Mattis? Okay, so he posts some really good research on sort of the um, um, anthropology of our diets a long time ago. And he posted something recently about native tribes eating meat-based diet. And the other thing that they ate regarding plants was fruit, right? Not the roots, not the tubers, not the stems, not the leaves, because that's the body of the plant. And the plant stores its poisonous chemicals there because it doesn't want you to eat the whole thing, right? Yeah. The plant wants you to eat the fruit, which is tasty and, you know, has the seed. Then you spread the seed later, you know? So that's another interesting concept I just learned. That's awesome. Um, and then something that I've heard a lot about is intermittent fasting for insulin resistance. Right. And personally, I haven't had to go to really extreme levels of intermittent fasting to help increase insulin sensitivity whatsoever. I think like naturally just, you know, stopping eating after dinner and having a good, I don't know, like nine or 10 for breakfast, naturally 12 to 14, it's kind of hard easy to achieve. But I've heard some people say like, oh no, you have to be 16, 18 hour fast to reverse insulin resistance. I personally have not seen that in my practice, but I would be curious to hear your, your input on it. Well, there's a website called scythe-fit.net and they have a collection of uh, studies regarding that. And there is magic that happens at 12 hours. And that's when like glucagon goes up and insulin drops down and sugar drops down and ketones go up. And that's with a more of a fat adapted person, right? So somebody who's a little bit more experienced in that. So intermittent fasting at 12 hours, that's when the benefits really begin according to the, what the research shows. But you know, one thing I want to say about intermittent fasting <clears throat> is that your meals have to be super satisfying, right? And give you that long-term energy. So you're not looking at your watch like, okay, it's 1115. I have 45 minutes before lunch. Okay, it's 1130. Oh my God, I can't wait till lunch. You know, like that. You should be able to breeze through yeah. your lunchtime and go like, oh man, I forgot to eat lunch, you know, then you have it, you know, so that that's the way yeah. intermittent fasting, it should be easy. Yeah. Okay. So see, I, same thing, like 12 to 14, I feel like it's easy to obtain. Um, and then I feel like when people have issues with it, I'm like, just like increase by like 30 minutes, try to like a day. Um, and again, it's all about how though you balance your meals the night before, making sure there's tons of protein and good amount of fat and just make sure that you're satiated and not, it's not carb heavy. Right. Um, and then what do you feel like are some of your favorite supplements that are helpful, um, whether they're nutrient concentrated like chromium or maybe an herb? I would love to hear your thoughts on. For insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. So pancreas support. And uh, the best way to support your pancreas is by eating pancreas. And so you can get like glandulars. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, chromium certainly. Um, and there's a company that I love called Standard Process. They don't pay me to speak, but uh, they got a product called Diaplex. And it's probably on Amazon. And, you, and I've seen that drop in myself and my patients. I've seen that drop blood sugar pretty well. Um, what is it so called? I'll put it in the show notes. Diaplex, D-I-A. PLEX. Awesome. Yeah. But when it comes to insulin resistance and diabetes, I'm not like supplement heavy. I don't really have a wide variety of supplements that I recommend. I, you know, when it comes to other conditions like, you know, like Lyme or something, yeah, it's all about supplements or detoxification. It's all about supplements. But when it comes to uh, insulin resistance, diabetes, it's like, it's, it's 95% your diet. Yeah. 
Yeah, always. Yeah. And I will say too, lifestyle. I feel like stress is probably right up there with it in the sense of you can have your diet good, but if you're always stressed, that's always going to constantly release this glucose and just never really let that settle down. So that's something yeah. to to also address as well. Yeah. Um, what are some other things though that you found in your practice to be really helpful um, with insulin and just overall health too? If people well, don't have resistance technically, but... Yeah, the, the main um, <clears throat> tools that I use would be um, writing down your diet or using chronometer, which is my favorite app. So like, you know, speaking, I yeah, I mean, there's, you know, my fitness pal or there's, oh. um, you know, low carb master, carb master, but so chronometer was developed for ketog- you know, ketogenesis and Dr. Mercola, do you know him? He yeah. sort of helped with that too. So chronometer is spelled C-R-O, chronometer. So I have my patients use that all the time and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like targeting their macronutrients. And so we're working with this app to get their diet to be more of the homo sapien diet, you know, like the, you know, human being type diet. Um, And then I have them test their blood for ketones. And when you look at all the labs, ketones, you know, ketones are the most important lab. You know, you can test A1C and insulin and, Mm -hmm. and all that. But when that, once those ketones are up, the blood glucose starts to come down, insulin comes down, glucagon goes up. And then you got the inflammatory markers, you know, for heart disease, like C-reactive protein and fibrinogen. Those come down with, you know, when you're in ketosis and then the, you know, triglycerides drop. So when you look at, you got all these heart disease lab tests and all these diabetes lab tests. If you have ketones up, everything else normalizes. That's where I come from. That's what I tell my patients. And that's what I see with the, with the lab work. So people come in and they're like, hey, I got these lab tests. And I said, all right, let's prioritize this. And then we'll measure that, but get into ketosis and just watch what happens. Yeah. What's your favorite way to test ketones? Is that something that you have to go to a lab for? Or is that something that they can, I don't know, get a monitor at home and test? Yeah, I get a monitor at home. Uh, my favorite is Keto Mojo. Their website is keto-mojo.com. And there's another one called Precision Extra, but I guess the blood sugar can be a little bit high on that. So Keto Mojo is the best way. Now, if somebody doesn't want to prick their finger, then you can do the urine sticks, like keto sticks. And there's some breath testing, but um, I just, you know, when it comes to my patients, they come meet to me and they're sick. So test your blood, you know, like let's do this the right way from the beginning. Yeah, yes. Um, I feel like the blood thing would probably be, I'm more for like, what is the most accurate? So I will prick my blood, no matter what, whatever it's for to test for it. Um, where can we find you on social media or I know that you have a massive YouTube channel. Where can we find you? Yeah. My favorite platform is YouTube. So just go on YouTube and search my name and find my channel that way. And then my office website is, <clears throat> excuse me, is the NHCAA.com, which stands for the nutritional healing center, Ann Arbor. Awesome. And so do you see people virtually or just in person? Yeah, um, we have local people coming in, and then we do phone calls, and sometimes we have people fly in for, let's say, three visits in two days or five visits in three days, then they fly home, and we follow up with phone calls. Perfect. I feel like that's what a lot of docs do, so that's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, if that's anything else that you want to add, um, I'm so thankful that you're here and that you shared some quick knowledge on insulin resistance. So do you have anything else you want to add before we, before we end it? No, I think we covered a lot. It was good. Thanks for your good questions. Thanks.